president's immigration policy thrown into even more chaos that after the Homeland Security Secretary was shown the door. We'll take a look at how an already harsh and frankly cruel approach could unbelievably get even worse. Then a former White House ethics attorney, he'll join us to take a look at the battle over the president's tax returns and all the investigations into both Trump and his businesses. Also, as we count down to the final game of March Madness tonight, we'll debate whether or not it's past time to pay the college athletes. Even the U.S. Senate is starting to get involved in the discussion. Evening, everybody, and welcome to RFL. I am Richard French. Well, Kirsten Nielsen, speaking for the first time since she resigned or was forced to resign as the Homeland Secretary, Security Secretary just yesterday. As you know, DHS has a vast array of missions. I want to make sure that we continue to execute them all with excellence through the transition. Uh, I share the president's goal of securing the border. I will continue to support all efforts to address the humanitarian and security crisis on the border. Uh, and other than that, I'm on my way to keep doing what I can uh, for the next few days. I sense a bit of relief um, if you read between the lines of the former secretary. Now, the president, he broke the news with a tweet, of course, where he thanked Nielsen for her service and announced an interim replacement. Now, Nielsen is leaving as we are seeing a surge in arrests at the border. And also, we have a president who is getting more and more visibly angry about the situation. In fact, Time saying he blamed Nielsen for the rise in apprehensions. Plus, NBC is reporting now that Nielsen and Trump, they clashed repeatedly over the administration's family separation policy. And if you think I'm speaking in the past tense, think again. The president reportedly, get this, wanted to reinstate the program and even expand it, as he says, it's a deterrent. But Nielsen apparently disagreed. And in fact, she showed the president here that the law and the court ruling said he couldn't do it. But the president, as we know, does not like it when people take a different approach than his own. Plus, CNN also reporting the president wanted to close the border at El Paso, but was talked out of it by Nielsen and others. Report also says that Trump insisted that Nielsen start denying asylum entirely to all people from Central America. This sounds like a travel ban, except for uh, immigration or asylum. It should. It's a familiar approach. He was also told by Nielsen that this was illegal. She even consulted with the White House counsel who, not surprisingly, agreed with her that it was against the law. The president also just visited the border with Nielsen in tow, and this was his message about our country. The system is full, and when it's full, there's nothing you can do. You have to say, I'm sorry, we can't take you. Uh, we've been trying to take people. And I have to disagree with it. Uh, we've been trying to take people, and you can't do it. You can't do it. Full no vacancy in America. That's what your president just said. Now, frankly, it is a shocking comment from any president of the United States to say such a thing, even this president. You don't need me to give you a history lesson about how this country even came about. But you would think somebody who called New York home um, would know a little bit about Lady Liberty. If he ever bothered to visit the Statue of Liberty, he would know in his old hometown here, you don't have to look far to read her mission statement. I want to read a portion of that poem on the statue, reading in part, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. Now, Trump's hardline approach to immigration, um, beyond being against everything this country has stood for, also reeks of some of the most hip hypocritical discussions, even by this president, that I can remember here. Um, and that is saying quite a bit. He's against chain migration. That's when one person comes into the country, then their families can eventually join them here in the country. He says that's no good. However, the first lady, that would be Melania Trump, her parents benefited from that exact program when they came here from Slovenia. Melania sponsored them for their green cards, and now, just in the last 12 months or so, they've become citizens. America really is the land of opportunity, especially if your daughter is the first lady of the states, apparently. Plus, several Trump golf clubs in our viewing area, by the way, they've been caught hiring undocumented immigrants, even though... The Trump Club knew entirely their actual immigration status. 
He doesn't want them here, but he's happy to have them working for them and the wages he's willing to pay, especially if he'll keep reminding them they better be quiet here because he'll go call INS. Then you've got the Trump winery in Virginia. It's owned by the president's brainiac son, Eric. Now, nobody will mistake that wine for a fine French Burgundy, but somebody has to pick the grapes, apparently. The winery wanted special visas that would allow it to hire those foreign guest workers and, yes, from those Central American countries. Now, Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner, at the same time the president says no more room at the end, we're full in America, he's quietly been working on a program that will allow a greater number of skilled workers to enter the country. Now, a major architect of the president's immigration crackdown is his senior advisor, Stephen Miller, and I think and somebody's got to fight me on this one, he is in the upper, upper echelons of creeps that populate this administration. Now, the more radical the policy, the more Miller apparently loves it. He's behind the push-outs of a bunch of folks um, from, you know, uh, Mattis uh, to all up and down the line, and Nielsen apparently as well. He is the guy who's calling for heads to roll in the administration. Now, this guy is so bad and so unlovable that even his own uncle has come out against him, reminding Miller where their family came from. Take a listen to Stephen Miller's own flesh and blood talking about him and the policies he's trying to push. Well, let me put it simply. Had we not been able to enter America when we did, Stephen Miller would never exist. It's hard to escape the conclusion that they want to disadvantage people coming from countries based on their religion, based on their ethnicity, and based on their countries and regions of origin. Okay. Um, let me bring in Andrew Whitman, our senior political correspondent. Listen, I, so you guys know I went down to the border um, for a better part of a week on both the Mexican and the U.S. side around San Diego and Tijuana. We're going to be bringing you a special shortly on what I saw firsthand. Immigration is a complicated subject. Um, I don't know anyone who's proposing here open borders across the board. Um, it's difficult. We have to say no to certain people. But I don't know, Andrew, when I heard what the president not only did, and Nielsen's certainly no angel, okay, but that he spoke for all of America that says we're closing our doors, um, that America is full. It was one of those moments that said, who is he? Who is this guy with no knowledge of American history, apparently, speaking for all of us that that's what we've become as a country? I, I, it was, to me, I don't know why, after all the things I've seen, but one of those moments where I said, what the, how have we gotten to this point where this guy thinks he can say it? And by the way, where is his party condemning him, not just the other party? To me, it was not an aha moment, but just a dis a really sad point that we've gotten there as a pitch to a base will now say America isn't for everybody. To me, it's actually even worse than that because, as you so clearly pointed out, America's not closed. It's, there's no no vacancy sign here. It's for certain people that we keep the doors open and for certain people that he wants to close them. And, and, and this is really one of the more serious moments, I think, in the Trump administration, for me anyway, and that's a pretty high bar to clear because there have been some real stinkers uh, as we've gone through. The president basically ordered Nielsen, and then when he went to the border, he ordered uh, border agents to break the law. He said, tell them that there's no room. Tell them they have to go back to Mexico, even though there's a court ruling that opposes that, even though the White House counsel has said, you can't do that. I mean, Nielsen actually, for all of the miserable headlines she's endured, had some honorable moment here by actually confronting him and saying, just reminding him of the law. and saying that you can't do that. And the most appalling part of it to me is that this has nothing to do with economics. This has nothing to do with all of the arguments that we're hearing. This is because, and there's no other way but a blunt way to put it, there is a segment of our population that is convinced, and this is a, a white segment of our population, that is convinced that the, uh, that the coloring of America is, is happening and is squeezing them out and they're losing power and this is a play to them. And the way we know this, well, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence, but there was a poll that was out last year from Quinnipiac at the height of 
the family separation policy. The family separation policy, putting kids in cages and separating them from their parents. Quinnipiac put out a poll. What do you think of it? 66% of Americans opposed it. The one group that supported it were Republicans, who basically are playing in that base of, of Trump's disaffected voters. Well, listen, let me give some reality, not the BS. I spoke to the immigration attorneys who are working their own on the border. The numbers vary widely, but somewhere between 10 and 40 percent of asylum seekers even get to have hearings. Now, who did I see? The president talked about seeing guys looking like UFC fighters here that were perfectly fine, that were m m drug lords or whatever, or hitmen, the way he described them. Now, I went to the most violent city in the world, if you believe the latest numbers in Tijuana. I saw the shelter. I saw women and children. I saw some guys, but I saw families. Now, again, not everybody gets to come into America and call it home. I agree with that. But the idea that we have become a country where we will even debate that what do we do when somebody comes here thousands of miles on foot, escaping some of the worst things you can ever imagine that I've heard firsthand. Okay, what are we going to do? Let's come up with a plan to take the kid from the mom, <coughs> lie to him when we do it, separate him, then lose him, and don't make no attempt to reunite them. And even when the court orders you to do it, say, well, have the ACLU or somebody else do it. That happened. So after that horrible chapter in this country, embarrassing chapter, not who we are as a country, what do we decide to do? The president says, let's do it, and let's do it again on steroids. What have we become where this is something that we say, oh, I, I can't believe he did that. What are we doing? This is not immigration policy. The president also came up with this rocket scientist move. Let's get rid of the judges at the border because that way they can't conduct hearings or find out who should or shouldn't be eligible for asylum. Listen to what somebody who's made a life of doing this, how he considers that in terms of a practical move as it relates to immigration policy for this country. They have to get rid of the whole asylum system because it doesn't work. And frankly, we should get rid of judges. You can't have a court case every time somebody steps their foot on our ground. That is the single, you know, I hate to say it, the single dumbest idea I've ever heard in terms of dealing with this current crisis. Look, the reality is our asylum laws guarantee that you set your foot on American soil and you say you're fearful of persecution in your home country, you get a hearing before an immigration judge to, to prove that or not prove that before you're deported. So, Andrew, the Stephen Kings of the world, the Iowa congressman who says all the things you did that was marginalized, and he was treated as, uh, you know, a fringe wacko, never once condemned by our president. Mm -hmm. And he's given oxygen to that portion of the population who never wanted to be able to say out loud maybe what they really thought. They feel emboldened now That's by true. this president. And I just keep waiting for a line, just a line, where they say, no, no. I'm, Mr. President, I'm a Republican here, but I don't believe we rip parents from their children here and then lose them. I, I don't think that's who we are. I'm still waiting for that. You may have to keep waiting. It, it, a lot of this is playing into the resentments of the voters who voted for him, and that's one of the reasons why they voted for him in the first place. And he's, you know, between immigration and health care, he feels like he's failed on his two main campaign policies, so he's pushing that forward. But we're in our team mode here. It's it's the blue team versus the red team. The, the funny thing is, and the red team. Ten in, years ago, Andrew, you and I talked about George Bush. Mm -hmm. He tried to have immigration reform in this country. Mm -hmm. He was a Republican. Mm -hmm. Is a Republican. Can you even recognize the party then and the party now? All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, the president refusing to release his tax returns to Democrats who are demanding this. I'm going to talk to my next guest who says he's hiding them because he's got a lot to hide here. And he was president of George W. Bush's chief ethics attorney. So this is not some partisan issue for him. Stay with us.